Awesome, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Make sure everything's working. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Uh, so as David alluded to, this is building the .NET Docs show website. And click, click, press buttons, click, ta-da. Uh, so I'm David, David Pine. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at DavidPine7. I have a blog, davidpine.net. There's some older stuff. I haven't really done much on there. Uh, and if you're curious in the source code, uh, my GitHub handle is iEvangelist, and that's where I have you know, plenty of source code out there for you to check out, but uh, in particular, the source code for the website. So uh, the backstory is we're uh, Cam, Scott, and I, uh, we're approaching a year. Uh, February of 2020 uh, is when we got together for what's called DevRel Camp. And DevRel Camp is an internal Microsoft event where developer relations gets together on campus uh, in Washington. And we kind of celebrate our successes throughout the year. We talk about some of the new things that we're working on. Uh, we have internal presentations and things like that. And uh, one evening over uh, some adult beverages, uh, Scott, Cam, and I decided that we should really pursue this vision of doing streaming, right? You know, COVID was just really getting off uh, running and we're like, well, why not deliver some content and try to, you know, bring on the developer community and highlight them. And uh, so this idea of the .NET Docs show was born. And the show, like I said, it, we started late February. So coming up here uh, next month, we're going to be approaching a, our one-year kind of milestone, which is really, really cool. Uh, and so I don't have very many slides because fortunately for you, the bulk of this is really just looking at the source code and the site itself. Uh, so I'm going to share that. Can you guys hear that too? I'm hearing some background sound. Yeah, well, we're hearing a little bit of sound in the background. It sounds like maybe somebody in the background is on the phone. So if everybody could just please check and mute, mute looks, your microphone. Looks like, uh, yeah. Got it, okay. Uh, so this is the actual website. Uh, how do I minimize this thing? I'll just bump this down. I'm gonna reshape this, give me one second. Uh, so this is the website, um, and if you go to .NET Docs .dev, that'll take you to our site. And this website's built entirely with Blazor server side. Uh, so there's several different hosting models that you can leverage when choosing Bla uh, Blazor. We chose the the server side for uh, I think the reason was that the the WebAssembly standalone alternative was still kind of in preview at the time. So we just kind of opted into that. And we haven't, we've been lazy, we're developers, so uh, we haven't updated it. Uh, but it serves as kind of like an historical look at all the shows that we've had thus far. So if you kind of navigate downward, uh, just two days ago, we had our, our good friend Jason Bach on and he shared some interesting stuff about uh, C Sharp source generators. Uh, two weeks before that, we had uh, Luis, who's now actually a co-host of ours, talking about F Sharp. I was on doing uh, some GitHub Actions and localization with Azure AI. Um, we had Andreas on talking about Xamarin and the community framework. Um, and you, you know, it just goes back further and further and further. Like I said, we've nearly had a year worth of shows. You can go look at all of our previous episodes. Um, and so this is using a pretty straightforward layout in terms of like our historical cards. We borrowed the concept that had existed before us um, with um, the ASP.NET community standup. They had this card kind of layout and they would show like the community standup and we thought that was an awesome thing. Uh, so we borrowed the cards uh, and uh, it's just a bootstrap styling. So it's pretty straightforward that way. Uh, we have a countdown, so you can get like a live counter here. And the really interesting thing about this countdown component is in Blazor, it's actually a .NET timer. So you have this .NET timer that's actually running and the changes to this DOM element are being communicated over SignalR in real time. So those little deltas, those changes to the DOM are happening uh, instantaneously, right? So it's, it's kind of neat to kind of rethink how the web is, you know, uh, evolving with Blazor. Uh, so, so hey, David, 
Yep. We do have a uh, question in chat uh, from Steve. I'll read that to you. Okay. Uh, now that client side Blazor is fully supported, would you migrate away from server side? If so, why? Um, I I might consider it, uh, but we've been happy with server side thus far. So there's differences in the the terms of the the way that those are served up. And um, I, I'm I'm curious if Scott or Cam could dig up a URL we could share. Uh, but there's these different hosting models. So to be very clear with the server side, this is very much like um, web forms or MVC or Razor pages in that uh, the client browser makes a request. That request is then served up by the server, but the server then renders that HTML on the server and then sends that back to the client. So uh, the alternative, um, as Steve had mentioned, would be uh, like the standalone web assembly where you're getting the, the same type of thing, but they're rather than the server rendering the HTML and sending it back, the server is just sending you basically static bits and then web assembly picks up and then all of the dynamic changes happen uh, via uh, API calls. So it's, it's, a, it's truly like a spy application at that point. Um, I actually do have source code uh, in our repository that's there where I started that effort of kind of, uh, transferring this into a WebAssembly alternative. And I stopped because it would actually require a little bit more work. So it's a slightly different mental model as well. So uh, one of the things I'm doing is within my pages, I'll take on a dependency of a, ser uh, a service that's abstracted out. So I have an interface for representing some sort of service. Uh, in this case, pulling up schedules for the show. So when we get that service um, in our page, that's happening on the server. So that's perfectly fine. That same model though, development model, you wouldn't want to do that on the client side. Because what that would mean is that you can have clients, um, for example, uh, hitting F12 and opening up your C sharp bits and looking at uh, your server, you know, your services in your pages on the client side. So if you have any sensitive information, for example, stuff like that. So you'd have to protect all of that behind uh, like a, an authenticated web API. And there's a little bit more um, kind of moving back. Like it's just a different, you know, mental model. I think it would help make the, the site a little bit more responsive. There'd be uh, some other advantages as well. So for example, with the countdown timer, that would be running on the client rather than on the server. Uh, but there's differences in that uh, since this is server side, this timer is the exact same number for everyone, right? Whereas if it's on a client, then you're dependent on the client's timer and then trying to calculate offsets with that time. And there's lots of little nuances, right? So there's, a, there's pros and cons to both. So I think it really depends on the use case, but that's a great question. One, uh, I'll chime in too, David. Um, mm -hmm. One big difference to note between Blazor client or what's officially known as Blazor WebAssembly and Blazor server is that with Blazor server, with, which is what we're using here on this website, there's a signal R connection that's required. If you're not familiar with signal R, that's essentially ASP.NET's abstraction over a WebSockets connection. And so what we have that's handling the, the updates and the DOM here, the UI is uh, JavaScript calls being sent mm -hmm. over this duplex signal R connection. And so in, that's why in the browser dev tools here, you're gonna see this WebSocket connection. Anytime the UI needs to be updated, it's going to again, leverage that WebSockets connection to handle those DOM updates. And you can see that it's happening every second because our timer is constantly getting updated from the server. Um, so this uh, duplex communication from SignalR wouldn't need to exist if you were doing it with the, um, the WebAssembly alternative. Um, but yeah, we're using binary here. Uh, so it's using the message pack uh, protocol uh, to try to be as optimal with, you know, and lightweight as possible. There's no reason for this to be human readable. Um, but if, you're, if you were using kind of the, the JSON protocol, you would see little JSON packets here that you could open up and see, you know, luckily this is just binary, so it's minute. Another difference I'll call out while we're on the topic is you will notice a difference in load time, the initial load time for the application when looking at those two hosting models. Blazor server will typically load faster 
than Blazor WebAssembly. Um, and the reason is there's a giant JavaScript file that gets downloaded with Blazor Wasm. Um, you don't have that with Blazor Server, therefore it loads much faster. Yep. Uh, are there any other questions? Because I'm not looking at chat. Yeah, there's a couple questions in chat. Uh, any concerns about having thousands of Signal R direct socket connections with the WebAssembly version? Uh, yes, there are concerns. Um, one of the things that uh, we're actually leveraging is Azure Signal R service as a backplane. Uh, so that alleviates all of those load and scalability concerns. Um, but it is something to be aware of. I guess we're not that popular in that our show or our website at any given time is not gonna have tens of thousands of people on it at, a, at any point in time. Uh, it's just not realistic for us. Uh, but if this was like Scott Hanselman's website or something, you know, maybe that, <laughs> that would be the case. Um, but it is something to be aware of. Yeah, uh, so definitely keep that in, you know, in mind uh, when, you're, when you're choosing uh, uh, the server side as your hosting model. A couple others with uh, Signal are, uh, in my case, uh, uh, for networks that are tied down, firewall restrictions, you know, my organization locks everything down. Are there any network constraints uh, when you're using Signal R, like firewall, or, is it, or does it pass uh, seamlessly through firewalls, the Signal R connection? Um, uh, the one thing I'll say here is a Signal R is intelligent enough that it will. Um, gracefully fall back to some other communication protocol if WebSockets is not supported by both the client and the server. So SignalR will try to establish that connection with WebSockets. So it'll do the, the handshake over HTTP to create the WebSockets connection. If for some reason the server doesn't allow WebSockets to be used, it'll then try to use server sent events to establish that connection if server sent events isn't supported for some reason, it'll then resort to Ajax long polling. So one of those three is very likely to work with, with your configuration. I assume the, um, the WebSockets version would be the most performant. And if that's the case, does it, do you get any kind of warning or any way of knowing whether or not the server supports it other than just hoping? Failing back, yeah. No, it's, it's all part of the initial negotiation, like the, the handshake that occurs. So uh, the server, you can actually specify, you know, what you want it to prefer, like what order uh, of fallback. Uh, I think the default is to prefer WebSockets. So the, the server, if it's configured to support that, for example, if you're in Azure and you have a Windows OS, you know, you'd have to configure IIS and whatnot to, to specify that WebSockets is enabled. Um, I think with Linux, it's that happens that way out of the box. Um, so however you're hosting it, um, uh, as long as the server has that capability, it's then dependent on the client to support that. And WebSockets is a very, it's actually an older technology. It's not nothing, you know, it's nothing new. So most modern browsers support it. Um, uh, and I think, uh, I think some of the limitations out of standard machines are like 50,000 concurrent connections with WebSockets. So it's, I mean, we're talking high, high volume stuff anyways. So we've got a couple of other questions here in the chat. Um, so would you use JSON protocol in development and switch to binary in production for security reasons? Um, so yeah, question? That, that's a really good question. Not necessarily for security, but just for, you know, debuggability. Um, uh, I don't think that, um, I mean, yes, while it is binary, um, it doesn't necessarily add that much more like security. Like you could still figure out ways to, uh, you know, look at those binary bits, right? And it's just really updating things on the DOM. So it's not like it's anything super protected or magical. Um, but for, for debugging, yeah, absolutely. That way you could see like the JSON packets that are coming over and make sure that they're the right thing and that they're mapped correctly. And um, yeah, so that, that's a good, good question. Yeah. And then uh, last question, we'll let you continue on here. Uh, any mm -hmm. security concerns about direct socket connections running, running binary packages? Um, not that I can think of offhand. 
Nothing uh, comes to mind. Yeah. Um, but if you're, if you're an individual who thinks like that, um, uh, I would encourage you to start looking at some of the bug bounties and security bug bounties that they have out there. Uh, you know, major corporations, Microsoft included, Google, Amazon, uh, all of those big individuals, they actually have security bug bounties out there where they'll say, we'll give you $30,000 if you can find this type of flaw in our system. Uh, and if you can push binary bits to some sort of server from a client that aren't supposed to be there and run something or get root access or whatever it is, like if you can do something like that, um, check out those bug bounties and get some cash. Uh, so yeah, we have an upcoming schedule. Um, so if you just expand this, it'll show the upcoming stuff. Um, the thing is we're actually booked out all the way until May now, uh, which is pretty incredible. Technically, uh, past that because we have a few in the backlog that we haven't oh, scheduled yet there you go yeah yeah um so yeah we're we're super happy with the way this has come together so far uh we've got uh, uh we had uh, an individual submit an idea to us um and they had asked for an rss feed so we implemented that for them and provided an rss feed so that was pretty straightforward uh we have in a way uh to submit to uh, empty slots. So if you see here, there's a May 3rd slot that's empty right now. Um, so we're saying that we don't have a guest at that point in time. So you can actually click submit a topic and you get this little form and it's, you know, filtered down to that date. You give it a title and an idea, your first, last name, email, Twitter handle, you send it off to us and we'll receive that. And so I want to kind of start looking at some of the code now uh, before we get into just like how beautiful the site is with uh, bootstrap. Uh, so can everyone see my, my visual studio instance? Yes. Yep. And then yes. is the, um, font size good enough to where you can read it and see the code and make sense. Yep. Okay. Looks good here. So we have, uh, the way that this was kind of put together was we have several, uh, little bits, um, We've got some extensions, we have some services, we have our web tier, we have tests because we're good developers. Um, we've got this other thing called Blazing reCAPTCHA that we'll focus on that in a little bit. But if we just kind of expand into the web aspect, this is essentially where you would go file, you know, project, new project. Um, you would choose Blazor, uh, you'd choose server side, and you'd get like this little template. So you end up with um, you know, a main entry point, and it follows all of the, the standard conventions that you'd expect to see. Some of the things that I've done slightly differently is I like to clean up the templates. So we've got a task returning main, we've got run async rather than just run. Um, and uh, let's see here, what else do we got? So we've got a startup, and our startup uh, has um, all, all the same, you know, ASP.NET core bits that you'd expect and, and you've grown to love over time. Uh, so dependency injection is a first class citizen. So we have some configuration and we walk up to configure services and from our services here, this is our service collection. This is where we start kind of registering various bits into our DI pipeline. And this is all the services that are gonna be available to our applications as part of the request and response pipeline. So we're adding application insights, um, we're adding authentication. Uh, so we have our, the capability for us to log in. So if I go back to the site real quick and I hit the, let me do the admin, oh, let me press buttons. If I go to the admin route, uh, only cool Microsoft employees can log in here because that's what the button says apparently. Let's see if it lets me in. Am I cool enough? Ta -da. So now we get so, 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 so my takeaway from this is is that I'm not a cool employee. Well, <laughs> funny, funny you should say that, Dave. It actually took us the longest time to figure out how to let Scott in. <laughs> so so Scott may not be quite as cool as, as you guys. Oh, uh, we've we've actually tracked it down. There was a Scott overflow exception in the logs. Yeah, um, there was, there was. Oh, that's funny. Um, so what, what that authentication lets us do is it adds a couple extra buttons uh, so that we can actually go in here and edit various bits of a show, like the details. Uh, so we actually have like a full blown um, content management system that we built around this Razor application. 
And we're using Azure storage, uh, specifically Cosmos DB. Um, and we're able to, you know, basically create from our Blazor forms here uh, shows and we'll persist those in Azure, you know, Cosmos DB, and we'll read them back out when we need them. And, you know, we can update things. And this just serves as our, our like I said, our content management system. Um, so yeah, we've added authentication. We've got controllers with views. Uh, we're requiring at least an authenticated user for the, you know, uh, the, the routes that are specified as authorized. Uh, we have memory cache um, and we're using memory cache for, caching some of our Cosmos uh, data rather than calling it every single time. Uh, since it doesn't change very often, as you can imagine, we're only going in there a few times, uh, you know, at least, you know, a few times a week. So it's not like it changes uh, very, very often. So we can cache a lot of that. Uh, and as we called attention to before, we're adding SignalR and specifically the uh, Azure SignalR. And then we have uh, protected browser storage. We've got response compression, and then uh, a couple little things here. Uh, so this is the services um, for our, our show. And if we go into services, uh, I've actually encapsulated all of our services into a separate class library. And they expose their own extension methods that register all of the services so that they're smart enough to know how to handle DI. So they have this extension method called add.net docs show services. They require a configuration instance. That's from our, our app, our host app here. So if we navigate into that, we're adding um, some HTTP clients for our Twitch and Logic app service. Um, so Twitch, we're using uh, some of their APIs for like our embedded videos and for uh, other various little bits, uh, Logic apps specifically and actually Cam's the one that introduced me to Logic Apps. I'd never used them before. Uh, so as a .NET developer, when you look at how are we going to uh, accept this form data and we're going to take that and we want to automate, you know, we want to do something with that form data. So are we just going to throw it in a database? Sure, we'll do that. But then uh, it'd be nice if we got an email, right? So I want to have an email show up when someone submits a show idea. So with Logic Apps, um, you can literally set up flows that are ex like super easy. Um, so like one of the flows that we have here uh, is for our calendar. So when someone proposes a show idea, we're gonna take that entry, all the form data, we're gonna pass it into a database. But then once that's happened, we're actually going to call into uh, this logic app, which will create a calendar instance, a calendar invite for that a specific event for us. And then the logic app will return an identifier that uniquely identifies that calendar invite so that we can later on call into an update logic app instance that will update that, that thing accordingly. So the way it works is uh, when an HTTP request is received, um, here's the, the URL, right? So this is the HTTP post URL. So from that URL, and the URL actually has all of the authentication encoded within it. Uh, and then we've got our schema here. So you get to define the JSON schema, what you're gonna post into the server for this logic app. Uh, so you define what that, that API looks like from this little logic app designer. So it, it literally took me probably three minutes to build out this full API end to end. Uh, and then what you do is you go into the store here. So there's uh, the next thing. So after that HTTP request is received, we're gonna do a create event. This is version four of the office suite. So this is actually creating a calendar invite. So then you just map parts of the JSON schema uh, to your calendar. So this is, uh, here's the date time, here's the subject that was given to us from our, our API, the end date, the start time, and all the various bits that you care about. And then from there, you take that and you send them a response, which is the identifier in the body. So now our database instance will actually have the ID for that calendar invite. So when we go change things, if I go back over here, see this? This is the calendar invite identifier, this huge, massive string here. And this lets us update this specific calendar invite with all of these details. So if I was to change things and hit save, uh, everyone who's on that calendar invite gets the update automatically in um, Outlook. And then that's basically the way we just automated ourselves out of a job. So it's a lot less work. Uh, so let's see. 
so that's just one of the services. There's many services here. Um, we've got different options. We have a Cosmos repository. So adding the Cosmos repository, uh, again, we're using uh, Cosmos DB. And I actually wrote uh, an open source project called um, Azure Cosmos DB.NET SDK, and it exposes the repository pattern. So it sits on top of the existing Cosmos database um, .NET SDK, but it, it this exposes um, the repository pattern. So you end up with, uh, I like to think, a, a little bit cleaner of an API surface area, right? So you get all your CRUD operations and it's async and it's uh, dynamic and a little bit more straightforward. Their, their API was kind of clunky in my opinion. So we have a schedule service and we inject into that an iRepository of our show. The doc show is just a very simple POCO. One thing to note is it has to be a subclass of item and item is a type that we've defined in our Cosmos repository um, uh, .NET SDK. So we have our date, we've got whether or not it's the show has been scheduled, if it's in the future, whether or not it's published, whether or not a calendar invite has been sent. Uh, we've got uh, a list of the different guests and hosts and tags and all this little kind of information about a show. And then the, um, the service itself exposes, it's just basically the decorator pattern at this point in time, the service layer could probably get, we could probably just rip it out and then not even have it. Because really what it does is uh, we can create a show and it just kind of expresses that as uh, walking up to the show repository and saying, create the show asynchronously, delete the show given its ID, get a show given its ID, get all the shows uh, since a, a point in time. And you can use expressions here um, or update a show. So create, read, update, and delete for all of our shows. And it was pretty easy to set that up. Um, so then the other thing uh, that we'll have, let me go back. Uh, we've got a date time service. We have Twitter service. Um, so that's, that's all of our services that were, you know, kind of encapsulated in this extension method to configure and specify and get all of those um, uh, options configured and things like that. Uh, so that's all well and good. Uh, another thing that we're going to do is we have a hosted service. So within ASP.NET Core, they introduced, this was back at uh, version 2.1, I believe, where they introduced the notion of a background service within the context of uh, your, your uh, ASP.NET Core apps. So what that means is you have an, uh, a service that's running always that's in process, so it's in proc, uh, but it's outside the request and response pipeline. So where that gets really compelling uh, is for uh, caching data. So a common pattern that you might see or you might want to consider is using a background service and an iMemory cache and your service that goes out and fetches data. And uh, as this is executing, this, ex this starts up before your app's even ready to start processing requests. So you can basically seed your cache for your, your website and update it uh, kind of infrequently as you want uh, in a background service. So this thing's executing right away at the start of the application. It's given a, a, a stopping token. So we can check whether or not a cancellation has been requested. And if it have, hasn't, we'll just sit here and keep looping. And then we'll do a task.delay uh, for our full cycle, which is a certain amount of time that we've configured. Uh, and then basically what we do is we just, we'll set the cache. So. Uh, we'll get the shows and we'll set the cache, which is with you know the most recent version of these shows. Uh, and we'll do that every so often here in the loop. Um, and that's configurable entirely. So we can specify that we want this to occur maybe once a day, as infrequently as that. Um, we're not using any distributing caching here. Uh, this is all just kind of in memory. And it's uh, assuming that we have a single server. So um, there's some different strategies you might want to employ if you're looking at like enterprise level, you know, different types of scalability and things like that. But uh, this is a pattern that was fairly kind of straightforward to set up. Uh, and it gives you the advantage of much quicker uh, secondary and sequential uh, requests for data. Uh, so we also have, uh, we add lettuce encrypt. Uh, it's kind of a play on words. I was looking for the lettuce emoji. I don't think we have that. 
uh, does uh, Cam or Scott want to talk to Let Us Encrypt? Well, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, would... not that story, Cam. The, the other <laughs> one. <laughs> oh. Um. <laughs> so, so, and and I'm 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 not like being flip. It. So <laughs> we. Our, our SSL certificate came from Let's Encrypt and um, Let's Encrypt sets very short expirations for their free SSL certificates. They said 90 days. And um, Let Us Encrypt is a NuGet package that purports to be able to configure um, automatic renewal from the app, that it just automatically goes out to Let's Encrypt and renews the certificate. We never got it working but that's what it's supposed to do. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to. So we've got uh, the running joke is not really so much a, a running joke as it is a running, like reoccurring meeting where it's like, oh crap, we have to go revisit updating our cert so our site's not broken. Um, so that's entertaining. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we're using Let Us Encrypt. Um, and uh, I think the play on words though is that Let's Encrypt was actually going to sue the creator of uh, of this open source software. So they ended up changing the name to Lettuce, uh, as in like Iceberg Lettuce. Yeah, that's right. So the, the NuGet package um, was developed by Nate McMaster, who used to work on the .NET team and then uh, shortly after left for AWS um, doing whatever over there. Um, but yeah, there was a Let's Encrypt threatened to sue him if he didn't uh, change the name. So he opened a Twitter poll and asked, what do I call this thing? It has to be something tasty that sounds like let's. Well, so lettuce is the word that was used. Well, that's tasteless. It's not taste. Right. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So, so could I, we, we, I've got a, we got a question, a couple of questions actually here, here in the chat. Can we maybe jump in and, yep. and answer those? Let's yeah. Uh, so, so Patrim's uh, wondering um, what advantage do you get coding the server side Blazor website instead of just doing uh, you know, ASP.NET MVC core? Um, want me to take that one? Yep. Two, two big advantages you're going to notice. Um, one advantage to using Blazor server over MVC is the component model that you get in, in Blazor. Um, so if you think about MVC and ASP.NET Core, you can use things like tag helpers, uh, view components. Um, view components in MVC are messy. There's lots of moving parts. And for that reason, it's, it's like watching a yard sale unfold in your, your code. Um, so really that, that leaves you with tag helpers, which are fantastic. View components were the answer to um, child actions not being supported in ASP.NET Core. Um, so you can certainly do component development in MVC, but it's not great. Blazor addresses that with the, what we call Razor components, which are the files that have a .razor file extension. Um, all sorts of stuff you can do there. And I'll, I'll make sure David shows one of those .razor files so you can kind of see how nice that component model is. The other big advantage um, to Blazor is the JavaScript interop that's built, up, built into it. So what I mean by JS interop is with this in Blazor, you can have JavaScript code call C Sharp and you can have C-sharp code called JavaScript, so it goes both ways. But what this allows you to do is more easily integrate your ASP.NET Core app, Blazor, with your existing SPA framework investments. So let's say you're a shop who's um, been doing Angular development for the last five years, and you've decided you want to put a stop to that. Maybe the skill set just doesn't exist in house anymore, and you want to use your C sharp skills instead. Well, you can easily do that again thanks to this JS interop. Um, the two uh, Blazor and your SPA framework of choice, whether that's React, Angular, Vue, they can happily coexist. the The final point I'll make is you can actually mix. Um, you can mix. Uh, MVC, Razor Pages, and Blazor 
in the same project. So there's no app model lock-in. Um, in other words, if you decide to go with Blazor and then you know you decide, well, this is kind of nice. We just built a, a Razor component in Blazor. Could we use this functionality in our existing MVC or Razor Pages apps? And the answer is yes, you can. Any other questions? I think the uh, one other question we had here was, is, is this source code going to be available on uh, GitHub? Uh, it is already. So actually, if you go to the okay. website, um, if you go to .NET Docs .dev, at the very bottom, there's a link for GitHub. And that is a link to the open source repository that is this. Uh, my only ask is that you give it a star if you like anything in there at all, because uh, we wrote it. <laughs> um, so let's jump into looking some more at the, the, the Blazor component tree and uh, some of the C-sharp bits and how they play with JavaScript and uh, all of that. So we have ourselves um, a, a little form here and we've got a submit form. This is where you can submit ideas. Uh, so it's uh, some uh, bootstrap markup. Uh, so we have an idea, we've got a text area. Uh, we have uh, you know, a form that identifies you know, first name, last name, an email, a Twitter handle. Um, and we have uh, a reCAPTCHA. So if, if you've ever seen reCAPTCHA, that means you've used the internet before, right? This is Google's um, vision of the world and they're doing some crazy things here uh, with kind of actually tracking your mouse movements. Um, uh, they're, they're looking at um, you know, how you've entered fields and uh, did you tab away from those or did you disappear into them? Uh, you know, how often did you change focus? They're monitoring all these things and they're determining whether or not you're a robot <laughs> just based on that, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but so how do we get this on the screen? Um, you know, if, if you've ever used their offering before, uh, you've probably done so with JavaScript. Um, we're actually doing so with JavaScript, but also with our C Sharp and our Blazor. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of show you that real quick. Um, but one thing I'm gonna do is, you can see the button here is not enabled. It's, uh, so I'm gonna hit, I'm not a robot. It's gonna spin, it's gonna check, and now it's enabled, right? Uh, so that entire little sequence of me clicking the check mark and the Blazor form um, kind of recognizing that it's been satisfied and then this button becoming enabled, what does that actually look like? So I'm gonna hit uh, send real quick. Um, great, we're done. It'll kick us back. Um, but so I have the submit form here and this is under our pages. And there's a few things to call attention to first. Um, when you've probably seen some of the documentation you've probably seen like the at code uh, um, uh, directives. And in here you can put your code and that's, that's perfectly fine. You can do that. Uh, one thing you might be curious about is, especially coming from web forms background is, you know, do you have any uh, sense of like true code behind and what would that look like if you did? Uh, so we actually have the ability to specify classes that shadow components. So Visual Studio is smart enough to uh, collapse these things for you. So if I have got a, a, a submit idea page here and, and it's called uh, dot razor. So that's the HTML, the, the razor view engine component tree. And underneath that, I have a razor.cs, so a C-sharp file. And it intelligently will kind of isolate those together. And you can do the same thing with CSS and JavaScript. You can actually have those all shadowed under there as well. Um, so with our component tree, we have a submit idea page. And the key thing is we have to make it partial. If I get rid of the partial class, we'll actually get a compilation error. And the reason is uh, it's ambiguous. Uh, part of the reason uh, for it being ambiguous is behind the covers, the Razor view engine is actually compiling a C-sharp class on your behalf to represent your component called submit idea page. So we have to make this one a partial. And now we can represent all of that code directive that we were doing before in a proper C-sharp class. So then you get your standard usings, you get your um, attributes so we can inject things. So we can inject navigation, we can inject our uh, logic app service, we can inject our loggers because we log things because that's what we do in .NET when we have problems. <laughs> we have parameters, so parameters are unique to component tree. Uh, so what you do is um, 
uh, when one component references another component within its markup, you can actually specify parameters. So you can pass things to it and they can be strongly typed. Uh, in this case, it's just a string, but you can pass full object graphs, hierarchies, um, any type that's valid in C-sharp you could pass. Uh, likewise, you can have parameters that are event callbacks. So people can register for events on your component. So when you have a component that fires an event, you can have a handler and a parent component, for example. And you can have all these uh, kind of advanced scenarios for communicating between different components. Uh, we have some various state for our component, whether or not um, uh, it's been requested, you know, whether or not there's a, a, a recaptcha is valid and whether or not the form is valid. We've got a model that represents the various bits of our form. Um, and we have this thing called an edit context. So edit context comes from Blazor and it's specific to the edit form, which is uh, another markup component that's available. So we've got our uh, page directive that says, this is the route, so forward slash submit. So if we go back to there, when I hit submit idea, it takes us to that at submit route. And then we've got an attribute that says allow anonymous because I don't want, um, I, you know, I want this to be open to anyone. I want anyone to be able to submit an idea to our show. And then we've got a container, our text uh, center. So this is like the heading, you know, ideas, we love them. Uh, and then we have the edit form where we specify our model. We have, uh, this is the event callback. So we say on valid submit, um, we can do async and await. So we're gonna submit our form given the context. And you can actually have validation inputs here so where you can do like the proper model binding. So your validation method for the show idea. And then on the show idea, you actually can annotate that as you would. So you can say that this is required. You get into like the, the component model data annotations and all of this is valid and it works and it's out of the box and it's free and available for you to use. And it's very, very compelling. So it lets you do like the two way data binding. Um, so that's all well and good. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, one thing before I show you the recaptcha is to just show you how simple this is. So we've got a Twitter handle here. And when, uh, when someone's submitting a show idea, if we don't know their Twitter handle, or uh, if we're, if you're submitting it for, uh, on someone's behalf, you can actually do this button where you say search Twitter. And what it's going to do is it's going to take your first name and your last name, and it's going to open up a new browser tab with that as a query string into Twitter that does a search for those people so that you could easily and quickly find that individual's uh, Twitter handle. And then you could put it in there, right? So it's, it's that little button is uh, essentially this right here. So we've got this little column. We have a label that says Twitter handle. We have an input text, which is bound to the show ideas Twitter handle. Um, and then we've got a little bit of C sharp where we say, the first and last name, and here's the Twitter query, which is this, the, the search URL with the query of first and last name. And when they click on that, we're gonna do a window.open given that. So, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. So let's look at the recaptcha. So we have a recaptcha. Hey, hey David, yep. before you jump into that, we've got a question in the chat here that I think would be a good time to answer. Okay. Uh, J Jacob would like to know, is the separate class for code behind considered a best practice? The idea of best practices in Blazor would be very useful to him to, to know about that. So maybe if uh, yeah. you, know, you guys could, could talk about that, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's only a, be a best practice if your team agrees on it and you have to set kind of preference boundaries. That's the way I like to phrase it. So I have several components that don't have uh, code behind. Um, and you can tell that because they don't have like the little carrot next to them that shows that they're expandable and that's okay. So my general rule of thumb when I'm developing something uh, in this case in particular is I'll kind of use my best judgment, but if I try to avoid the at code uh, at all costs, if I see that I'm doing it for a little bit, like maybe defining parameters, I think that's okay. Uh, Cause that's kind of minimal, right? So your parameters are visible and you can show that you're probably binding them to something in your, your markup. And that's, that's probably fine. Where what I try to do though, is if ever I find myself writing some sort of logic or relying on services or interacting with logging and, you know, HTTP calls, stuff like that. I typically prefer to kind of treat that as a more mature C-sharp class, right? 
And it's just for me, that's the way I, I'm more comfortable doing it. So again, I advise um, that you, you work with your team, you kind of hash out those, um, you know, whatever guidelines, whatever makes you guys feel comfortable. Both are available, both are valid. Uh, it's just a matter of opinion at that point in time. It's kind of like tabs versus spaces, right? Well, everyone knows tabs are far superior. Ooh, um, wow. No, I was going to say spaces. Who are right. we? We'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. We've apparently <laughs> lost our internet connection to Madison, Wisconsin. I, I was going to add something to what David said. Um, it, with regards to this is uh, for the code, code behind best practice uh, question. Um, so there actually is uh, an option in Visual Studio. David, if you were to go up to your tools menu mm -hmm. and go to... Um, I believe it's options and then preview features. It's under the environment there. I'm gonna, I'll explain why I'm pointing to this in a minute. Um, there is an option in here, um, fifth, yeah, number five there, enable experimental razor editor. If you enable this, uh -huh. you're gonna have a, a much better experience working with Blazor if you use that at code directive approach that David was referring to. So in other words, if you type at code curly braces inside of your dot razor file and put your C-sharp code in there, without this option enabled, you might struggle a little bit with your C-sharp code and notice that IntelliSense isn't the greatest. Um, for that reason, a lot of customers, especially if they're unaware of this new razor editor, they will just move to that code behind approach because you know that's the C sharp experience you're used to and IntelliSense is fantastic there. Um, I, have so not I would say if you are one of those teams that decides you want to use the code directive and you know put your C sharp code in with your markup, uh, definitely give this experimental razor editor a, a, a try. Uh, what they're doing is they're completely rewriting the razor editor uh, simply because um, the Razor universe has evolved so quickly um, and it's just easier to rewrite from scratch to accommodate all of the edge cases that exist. Yeah, I think the Razor view engine is very, very interesting because it's a parser that has to understand and provide statement completion for multiple languages. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of unique in that, that sense. Um, I didn't know that feature existed, those feature toggles. So thank you for sharing that. I'll have to check that out. Um, so if we look at the Razor, uh, yeah, the, the reCAPTCHA uh, component, we have an uh, evaluated um, uh, event callback and it returns a, a tuple that says whether or not it's valid and uh, a string array of errors if there are any. Um, but where is this actually coming from? So we, we built out a component. We've yet to uh, publish this. Uh, but the idea is that since it's a component, you could configure it and uh, consume it in any Blazor server-side application um, since it's just a component, right? And you could take on that library and um, it'd be pretty straightforward to do. So it gets really, really elaborate in that this is the markup for the reCAPTCHA uh, HTML. It's literally just a div with an ID uh, of the ID that we specified in the code behind. Uh, so we seal it and we uh, implement iDisposable and we inject, uh, this is the first time we've shown this here on this uh, uh, presentation, but the iJS runtime. And this is, this actually represents the JavaScript interop between the client browser and the uh, the instance of our application. And this is from C Sharp, right? So we're in C Sharp and we have this thing that we can basically uh, do interop calls with JavaScript. So we're gonna get more into that in a second. We have a couple options. We have our HTTP client factory. We've got that parameter that we defined, which is an event callback um, we've named evaluated. And we have a little, uh, a few a few little things here and we're gonna, we're gonna dive into some of those now. So. Uh, after the component renders for the first time, uh, we are going to we're going to do some stuff with our configuration options. I'm going to kind of breeze over this real quickly because it's less important. 
Um, but we do have some options that are available that have to be configured. Uh, and those have to be configured the same way that you configure all of the stuff that we talked about before with dependency injection. So it requires the options pattern. Uh, we specify a recapture options. We have these actually stored in Azure Key Vault um, and they just flow through our system kind of implicitly. Uh, but we have a recapture options which define a site key and a secret key. And these are from Google. Uh, and these are what allow us to kind of verify and use and register our usage of their service offering. So those two things, once they're configured, um, they kind of just flow through this component as needed. Um, so then we're gonna walk up to JavaScript and we're gonna say await to JavaScript load recapture async. So this first call here uh, is defined as a JS uh, interop. Uh, this is basically just a fancy name for our extensions class. So if you're familiar with C-sharp, you're familiar with extension methods. So we actually extend uh, the JavaScript runtime and we express that as invoking a void method asynchronously and it's named recaptcha.load. So as you might imagine, there should be some sort of JavaScript running somewhere in our client browser that's called recaptcha.load. So if we go look at our uh, uh, component JS, we actually define uh, an async function called load, but here at the bottom is where we do all of our stuff on the window. So we say window dot recaptcha is equal to this new object literal. And the object literal defines a load method, a render method, and a get response method. And load was defined up here. So it's an asynchronous function. And what it does is it gets all of the script tags in the, in the current document. So this is JavaScript world. And this is, this is kind of minimal JavaScript, right? This is, uh, we're not talking millions of lines. This is under 50 lines of JavaScript. So we've got our, our C sharp that calls into this JavaScript function that to load it. So essentially what this little block does is it uh, takes the script tags from, it's gonna create the, a script tag and basically append it if it's not already there to our, uh, our, uh, the head element of our, our document. And it's, it's pulling in uh, the recaptcha API JavaScript. It's just basically making sure that it's there. If it's not there, it's loading it and adding it to the head. Uh, and then we specify that it's been loaded um, and then that's all well and good. And then if we go back out to our, our component here, the next thing it does, once it's been loaded, we verified that it's loaded. So the JavaScript is now in the DOM. Then we call JavaScript render recapture async, given this, which is the instance of this component, the recapture element name, if you recall from our markup, that's actually the identifier for that div and our site key. So let's go look at that function. This function is a little bit more interesting uh, in that it's actually taking um, the, the JavaScript runtime and invoking an int it's going to be returned this time rather than void. Uh, we're calling recaptcha.render. And we have this interesting little thing here called .NET object reference. .NET object reference is a way that you create references to your C sharp objects that can then later be referenced from JavaScript. So before, if you recall, we had load, which was C sharp calling into JavaScript. Now what we're doing is we're passing an instance a reference to our component into uh, JavaScript. So now if we jump back over to JavaScript, we're gonna look for render. Uh, render is right here, function render. This is our .NET object, right? That's the representation of that object. Our ID, which is the element ID and our site key. So we're gonna say if Google recaptcha, this is just a little truthy check to make sure that it's been loaded. Um, then we're gonna get the document query selector, given that pound uh, identifier, this is how you would get the, a reference to that DOM element. And you're gonna say return Google recaptcha render the element and then pass in this object, which is basically our site key. We have a callback and an expired callback. So the callback is actually a method from, our, uh, go from Google saying, here's the response. Uh, so when we get the response, we're going to say walk up to our .NET object and invoke a method on it called onEvaluated with that response. 
So once we have that response, you'll notice down here in our markup or in our C sharp that we actually have uh, a method called on evaluated given a recapture response that's just a string object. And we have to decorate that to be JS invocable. So this basically identifies that this component uh, has this method that's invocable from JavaScript. So, uh, and we have our evaluated, which we can say it has a delegate. Uh, this is our event callback. Uh, if that happens, then we'll do a little bit more stuff here where we go out and we verify that response um, given our HTTP client. Uh, we ensure that uh, it's a valid and successful recapture response given all of these things. So there's this recapture API where we have to verify our content, which is basically the, the response. So to put that into uh, uh, like the full circle, we're on the form, we're the user on the form, we have our idea, we click that we're not a robot. So what happens is um, this unevaluated is fired. Um, the, the JavaScript has that callback. It, it calls into unevaluated. It then takes that response payload and makes an API call to uh, this, this endpoint for Google where we verify the content to ensure that it's not a robot. If and only if it's, uh, it's been validated, then we communicate that via this event callback. Now, if you remember back over here in our submit idea page, we had an event handler for unevaluated. So we get our is valid and our errors, which is represented as this tuple. And uh, we'll, we'll basically just mark whether or not the recapture was valid. And we have that bound to the disabled of that button. So that's basically the full circle of all those different interactions. And it's kind of crazy to think how complex and how many moving parts there are. Um, I, don't, I don't think it was super difficult, but it's kind of neat because it demonstrates all of the various bits, all the different moving mechanics, um, how you can do interop between C Sharp and JavaScript, JavaScript back into C Sharp. And uh, I mean, it, I think it looks kind of neat. So did I miss anything, Cam or Scott? Um, no, we, um, I noticed we have some questions in the chat here that we should get to. Uh, Cam mm -hmm. had to take off. Okay. Um, the first question, I'll read it here, David, is it's getting to, um, the options pattern stuff you talked about earlier. Uh -huh. Is there a reason you use iOptions monitor in this app versus iOptions for the reCAPTCHA options? Will they change? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so the reason I decided to use the iOptions monitor, um, and if you're unfamiliar with that, so the options pattern basically exposes a way to use configuration through dependency injection with .NET uh, Core, right? Um, so I options of your class is the typical pattern. Uh, one of the more advanced, I would say, interfaces is the I options monitor. And what this allows you to do is get the current value at any point in time, but also register for on change events. So if the configuration for whatever reason does change, um, you can kind of make sure that you're up to date, right? So the next time your component's being used, it's using the latest site key and secret key. The reason I chose to do this is because I made it a component and I don't want to make assumptions about the way configuration uh, is handled for whoever's consuming me as a component author. So the idea would be as a component author, uh, same with any, you know, being like a library author, you want to make sure that you're handling all of those different edge cases. So to me, it felt as though if this was ever to get, uh, you know, put as like a NuGet package and consumed by other people, they at some point in time might have found value in, you know, updating their, their configuration. If so, I would want to make sure that my app does, or my component does work correctly. So it's not needed right now, uh, the way we're using it, but again, kind of, um, future proofing ourselves a bit. Good question. Um, there's another question in here. Um, question is, can you use TypeScript instead of JavaScript? And this is referring to the IJS runtime stuff you were talking about, the, the interop. Absolutely. Yes. 100% uh, you can. Um, uh, the, the reason you can use TypeScript um, is because TypeScript 
uh, gets compiled down to JavaScript. So all you need is JavaScript. Um, and I ch I, I'm actually a huge proponent of TypeScript. I've given many of talks on it. I'm super excited by the language. Um, uh, I just felt as though for this little bit, uh, you know, less than 50 lines, it wasn't necessary to, to tie into a, you know, a transpiler and having more build hooks and stuff like that. So for me, uh, having a simple JavaScript file was enough, but yes, 110% you can, and you probably should use TypeScript. In fact, if you have a lot more, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, logic built out for, for JavaScript functionality. Yep, good question. I did put a link um, to a related blog post um, in the chat. So if you are interested in using TypeScript and uh, instead of plain old JavaScript, there's a blog post there that shows you exactly how to do it. Um, long story short, the TypeScript has to be converted, converted to JavaScript first. Awesome. Um, Another yeah. question for you, David here. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Yep. We're getting all sorts of questions. Keep them good. coming. Good, good, good. Um, question is, was there a blog post or something that helped you figure out all of the back and forth on that recapture component? Um, or was it all just trial and error? You were just kind of hacking your way through it. Well, I, I have an, uh, a comment here. I was inspired by this individual. Um, they had uh, this open source project which basically did uh, something very, very similar to what I was doing. Uh, so that's, that's more appropriate for them. They actually built out the same type of thing um, and looks like they've even taken it further now. They've got the, the WebAssembly versions and whatnot. Um, but I, I was inspired directly by their, their working stuff here. Um, so I, I made it my own and changed things and updated it and kind of made it more of a component type thing rather than full blown app and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I, there was certainly blog posts. There was the open source projects. There was, you know, stack overflow, um, all sorts of things. And um, one thing that I like to do is I'm constantly coding <laughs> like nonstop on, on different languages and platforms and frameworks. Um, so I'm constantly learning and, and, uh, kind of reinventing myself as a developer. So, uh, but I would, I'd probably uh, shamelessly plug the docs at, uh, you know, doc microsoft.com. Um, there, I don't know if there's interest in picking this topic back up, but there was a question before we even started this uh, presentation that was getting at, you know, hey, if I'm on a web forms app, um, should I be concerned? Um, am I being forced to Blazor? Do we want to talk through that for a couple minutes? Um, yeah, I, th I think actually you would have more details on that. I, I think the answer is though that no, you're not being forced. Yeah, so um, I'll kind of, I'll rehash some of what I said earlier, I know not everyone was here when I was talking through that, but uh, the gist is if you have a web forms app, um, there is no danger of being unsupported. And the reason for that is um, it, web forms depends on .NET framework. Uh, therefore, web forms has the same support lifecycle, same support policies as .NET framework. So um, .NET Framework will continue to ship with the Windows operating system as a critical component. And for that reason, will probably be supported for, I would guess, the next 10 years. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is there's no reason to be, uh, to, to feel like you're being bullied um, to move off of web forms. That being said, there are some significant advantages to moving off of web forms. And I see uh, Jim in the chat is saying .NET 5 and beyond will not support web forums, right? That's correct, Jim. Um, uh, so if you wanted to use .NET 5 or even .NET Core, um, any versions of that, it will not work with web forms. Um, you are tied to .NET framework with web forms. Uh, some of the advantages of moving to .NET Core or .NET 5 um, are uh, cross-plat support. So if you want to host your application on a Linux server, let's say you want to 
uh, spin up a Alpine Linux server, or, uh, Red Hat, and host it there. You can do that if you're on .NET Core or .NET 5. You cannot do that with .NET Framework. .NET Framework uh, with web forms is shackled to um, IIS and, and Windows. Uh, so cross-plat is a big advantage. Uh, another one that's often overlooked is uh, dependency injection. Dependency injection is a native feature in ASP.NET Core. Um, in a web forms app, you would have to use a, a third party NuGet package to, to use DI. Um, Autofac, uh, Unity, Ninject, Structure Map, things like that. And to be honest, uh, working with dependency injection in, in classic ASP.NET is, is a pain. Um, let's see, we talked about DI. Another big advantage would be um, the side-by-side -side versioning you get with uh, .NET Core and .NET 5. So you can have mul multiple versions of those SDKs installed on the same machine, and you do not have to worry about uh, those conflicting with each other. Uh, whereas with .NET Framework, th there's always that fear of something breaking when you have to install a new version. Uh, you know, I can think of I can count on at least one hand how many times um, in the real world I was building apps and we had to upgrade to a new .NET Framework version and something broke when we installed a, a newer version of it. Uh, that's no longer the case with .NET Core and .NET 5. You can have side-by-side -side installations that don't interfere with each other. They're completely isolated. And then of course, uh, open source. So .NET Core, .NET 5, are open source. Everything's on GitHub. And for that reason, you have the support of the community behind it, um, which means the product will iterate much quicker. Um, if, if there's a, a major issue, chances are someone, on the, uh, someone in the community will address that and get it fixed up right away. Uh, and so Bob has a great question here that I'm realizing I glossed over. The question is, is .NET Core and .NET 5 the same? Um, sort of. So <laughs> uh, think of it this way. Um, .NET Core 1.0 through 3.1 are .NET Core. .NET 5 is still .NET Core. It's just they dropped the core name from the product. Um, and the reason why they've dropped the core name from the product as of the 5.0 version is the theme of this release going forward from 5 to 6 is convergence. They're trying to, uh, to make it easier for customers to just use .NET and not have to think about, well, what flavor of .NET do I need to, to build this application? Uh, you know, is it .NET standard? Is it uh, mono? Is it .NET core? Uh, those things, they hope to converge into .NET 5 and .NET 6. So moving forward, you will, or I guess, one way to think of it is essentially you have .NET Framework and .NET 5 Plus. Those two things to concern yourself with. Confusing, I know. And to make it even more confusing, um, I'll even put this in the chat just so I'm completely clear. .NET 5 still has ASP.NET Core and Entity Framework Core. So the .NET 5 product dropped the core name. ASP.NET and Entity Framework still have core in their names as of 5.0 and beyond. So I'll type it in chat here. Yeah, it's one of those things, versioning and naming things. There was a lot of going back and forth with marketing and you know, what do we do here? Um, the backstory there, when I finish typing this. Five. Yeah, to, to just reiterate or, or echo uh, Scott, uh, one way I like to think of it is .NET 5 is really .NET Core 4.0, but instead of being .NET Core 4.0, it's .NET 5. They dropped core and they went to five to avoid um, confusion with .NET Framework 4.8. And um, it's 
you know, it's, so five has a bit of significance, uh, even though the uh, they're not fully unified. Um, if you do want to still use uh, .NET Framework um, or you know .NET Core, um, various ways that you can do that is that you can have um, class libraries that target uh, .NET Standard 2.0. And 2.0 is the one that gets you, that's the bridge, magical bridge between the, the two. Yep. The reason why ASP.NET Core 5 still has core in the name is ASP.NET 5 was a thing. Um, so ASP.NET 5 is what, uh, is what exists. I guess that was the beta name for ASP.NET Core. Um, so without getting into too much detail, before ASP.NET Core shipped, the beta name for it was ASP.NET 5. Uh, so for that reason, they had to keep Core in the name um, so that people can actually find support for their questions on Stack Overflow and elsewhere. Right. So the other question from Bob, another great question. So new development should use .NET 5? It's another it depends answer there. Um, I'll dig up a link. Um, the answer to that question really comes down to the, the support that you're looking for, the support model. .NET 5 is what we would refer to as a current release. It's not a long-term support release. So if you're looking to be supported for the next three years from the date the product ships, you'll wanna stick with an LTS long-term support release. Uh, right now, there are two LTS releases, um, 2.1 and 3.1. The next LTS release will be 6.0. And I will dig up that support policy yeah. doc that and shows. Um, and Scott, we should mention that .NET Core 2.1, which is an LTS version, but I believe that the long-term support for that is ending in August. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, it's 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 later this year. Yep. So I if you do this. have so if you do have .NET Core 2.1 applications out there, it, it it is probably time to start thinking about what what you're going to need to do with those you know, here over the spring and summer. You know, before that date sneaks up on you. Yeah. Good point. I just put the link to that support policy in the chat, and what you're going to find if you navigate to that page is a supported versions table. What David said is correct. Uh, support for .NET Core 2.1 will end on August 21st of this year. Uh, support for the next LTS release, which is 3.1, will end on December 3rd of next year. Um, the, the plan moving forward um, is every even numbered release of .NET will be an LTS release the odd number ones, like five, will be current releases. So if you are, you know, one of those shops that always wants to take advantage of the latest and greatest features, and you know you'll have time to migrate to the next release when it comes out, the current release train is definitely for you. But if you're one of those shops that knows you're not always gonna have the time or resources to migrate to that next release, you're probably better suited to hang out on those LTS releases where you know you have that three years worth of support from the release date. Yeah, I stopped sharing my screen. Um, I, th I think that's pretty much it in terms of like formalized demo. The, the last slide was really just a thank you to everybody. Um, if there's any questions you have, Feel free to come off mute and ask them. And um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone though for sticking around and engaging and uh, hopefully this was a value to you. Uh, there is uh, one question here. Um, so if you're currently developing with .NET 5, what does the transition to .NET 6 later this year look like? It's expected to be simple. They have promised they're done making significant breaking changes. Um, I've heard this directly from um, the architect himself, David Fowler, that the, the transition to six from five should be very, very simple. Uh, we do publish migration guides in our, our doc set uh, that show you how to get from one version to another. 
that will be published in the early previews of uh, .NET 6. So if you are one of those customers that wants to be playing around with the preview releases of .NET 6, we will have guidance that shows you, you know, how you can test out that migration from 5.0 to 6. Um, another question from Paul, any thoughts on MVVM versus MVU? Noticed it did not seem to use either, maybe, maybe for simplicity. Um, oh yeah, my, because that's, that's just late night coding. i like, I didn't follow any standard. I mean, I just threw this thing together <laughs> haphazardly. Uh, the, the fact that we even have a website is kind of, um, ironic and funny. So if there's anything in this, uh, app that you find that you're like, what in the world was he thinking? Just know that I was probably up at like 11 at night, just like a zombie, just smashing the keyboard. Uh, it, it's evolved kind of organically. Um, uh, I, to, to your point, I didn't follow any of those patterns because I just, it, it was, you know, it wasn't something I sat down and I said, I'm going to architect this beautiful thing. It was literally, let's just throw together some bootstrap and, uh, you know, some pages. And I was honestly still learning Blazor at the time. Um, uh, ideally, I'd probably rewrite it and formalize it and have more tests than I have now. And um, uh, if you actually dive into some of the, 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 the formalized code, looking through it, like, you know, the pages and the shared stuff, and I would do things dramatically differently now, um, especially that I have a bunch of that uh, kind of the foresight, um, but it was just a, an organic evolution of late night coding. So it's not something to, to, to use as a starting point for uh, an enterprise <laughs> application. <laughs> so, so David, I have a question for you. you. You did a lot of Angular development, you know, mm -hmm. before this and, you know, develop, you know, single page, you know, applications. And, you know, my intent here is not to start a food fight of, you know, my tool set is better than your tool set. I mean, because those are just really not productive. Yeah. But, you know, maybe could you describe, you know, kind of the learning curve as somebody who's done, you know, both technologies, kind of, kind of the tools and just, just a little bit of your experience, um, you know, because, you know, a few years ago when we met, you were pretty heavy in, into, in, 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 in not just .NET, but also, you know, the Angular development as well. And so yeah. just, just describe your experiences with both. So, yeah, no, I, I spend a lot of time still in, in Angular. Um, and uh, one thing I've grown to love about Angular is TypeScript and the ecosystem there. And they're, they've come a long way. The, the CLI actually helps out quite a bit. So you can use uh, the Angular CLI for templating. Um, and I think it was actually somewhat inspired by some of the stuff that we've seen through the .NET CLI. And it's kind of ironic that I would have expected some of the things to be influenced the other way around. Um, but the, the tool chain uh, for Angular has come a long way. Angular is still very, very opinionated, but you can say that about almost any, you know, uh, uh, platform or framework that's out there. Uh, same is true with .NET and C Sharp. There's, you know, just certain ways of doing things. Um, uh, I will say that I, I like C Sharp more than I do TypeScript, um, but uh, that's probably because my hatred for JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I think they've both come, uh, you know, very, very far. They both uh, have made me happy and angry all at the same time. Uh, and I think there's places for both of them. I don't think there's, you know, one right or wrong answer. It's, um, it depends really on what you're trying to achieve. And uh, some of the stuff I've done with Angular in the past was a lot closer to some of the native uh, JavaScript capabilities like video conferencing apps and things like that. And it's hard for me to kind of wrap my head around how I would even approach that type of stuff because it's so close to some of the native JavaScript stuff. I don't even know how I would do that in Blazor, right? So for me, Blazor is at this point in time more for kind of straightforward, you know, model binding and, you know. Uh, Line of business type apps. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, you know, if you're trying to do something that's, um, you know, closer to, what JavaScript has been, you know, evolving to be and promising to be, you know, in the browser. Uh, it's all about what you're trying to do. 
But I think WebAssembly is a huge step forward. WebAssembly actually takes your browser and it flips it on its head. And it, the way you should think of uh, your browser now with WebAssembly is that it's not really serving up you know, static sites or anything like that anymore, or just you know, website or you know, line of business stuff. It's turning your browser into an app store. So imagine being able to have AutoCAD from a browser, that's possible with WebAssembly or doing video editing or heavy image editing or you know, where you want that near native performance. You can run Rust and C++ and uh, you know, now C Sharp. Um, so it's, I think once they're, uh, they start getting more involved with uh, narrowing the bridge between some of the interop and you know, how you represent some of those things in C Sharp, like once you start getting full support for some of the video capabilities and stuff like that, I think it's going to be a lot easier of a choice to go with, you know, with Blazor for set. But to your point, I mean, there's there's a lot of things to consider. I, I think the nice thing about Blazor is it it fills that void we've had in the .NET community for the longest time, and that was these SPA frameworks were eating our lunch. Uh, the customers were they. We constantly had to go pick up some JavaScript framework to get that rich UI interaction that customers crave. Right. So naturally they'd gravitate towards typically Angular because you know Microsoft had a pretty strong partnership with Google at the time. So Angular seemed like a good choice. Um, the other popular one was uh, React because we had project templates for that in Visual Studio. Um, but we're finally at a place now where you can mm -hmm. use uh, C sharp front and back, and it finally has the same appeal that Node.js had long before us. Same language front and back, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. uh, David, there's a question for you here. Did did uh, did your hatred for JavaScript stem from Angular development? <laughs> did Angular do this to you? No, no. It actually uh, the irony to that is. Angular is actually what made me start liking JavaScript. Uh, and uh, that was Angular JS before there was, you know, TypeScript and the evolution of what, what that's become. Um, I think TypeScript is amazing. Uh, I think JavaScript uh, is an uh, in interesting language. Um, but I first started using JavaScript uh, within web forms back in the day. And it was, you know, if you think about how the web has evolved, like, you know, Back in the early 90s, it was really just HTML. They had the spec, here's HTML, here's your static documents. And then you know what, CSS came along, we could style those. But then they're like, well, what if we wanna have a button and functionality? Well, then JavaScript was born. And then you would literally take JavaScript and sprinkle it throughout your, you know, your markup. And you would have these you know, little event handlers. And it was just really like a kind of a scripting language. Like, okay, someone clicked on this, now what do we do? Well, take, you know, read parts of the DOM and do something with that. Um, and it, it became so much more. So JavaScript is, is uh, it's everywhere. And I think part of the problem is that, you know, when Brandon Ike uh, developed JavaScript, there's this quote where he talks about how he, he kind of did it in 10 days, right? Or two weeks or whatever it was. It was a very, very short amount of time. And the language is a testament to that. It's gotten a lot better, especially with some of the standardization efforts around it. Um, but no, it definitely wasn't Angular that got me uh, hating JavaScript. Um, in fact, it was the other way around. I think Angular is kind of what made me realize that if you sit down and you think about things more pragmatically, you can take this language and you can develop something in this type of infrastructure and you can start building uh, true enterprise applications out of it. And then Angular proper, you know, the, the Angular 2, and now they're on Angular 10, I think is the version. That is so much further along than it was. And I think that's a huge testament to uh, the advent of TypeScript. So, yeah. Other question for you. Do you know if Angular or any other JavaScript tech is going to embrace uh, WebAssembly? Um, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, I don't, I guess I don't know how some of those frameworks would really embrace it. Because um, WebAssembly is, different, right? So it's, um, well, I'm trying to think because I mean, so Angular, for example, and other JavaScript, you know, SPA frameworks, they provide um, uh, a framework for building a specific type of application. Uh, whereas WebAssembly is the technology that lets you take, uh, 
you know, C++ or Rust or, you know, these different kind of languages and compile them to run in your browser. So your browser understands ECMAScript, which is, you know, JavaScript, but it also now understands WebAssembly. So to me, they're, they're kind of different things. They're different intents. So we're getting a little little feedback here. So somebody might want to check uh, muting their microphone. But I think uh, if there aren't any more questions, we'll go ahead and, and kind of call it there. Uh, Scott and David, and then you know Cam, who who had to take off a little bit earlier. We thank you so much for coming and, and presenting to us tonight. This is I, I always find it really great when somebody presents kind of a full application, you know, rather than just kind of snippets, and we're able to kind of see how all of these different things work together. And, and so that was something that was really interesting to me. Uh, so we do do our normal uh, giveaways and, and we'll be doing that tonight. So I, I think the uh, spreadsheet uh, to enter your name for the giveaways raffle uh, is, is in the chat. So if you have not, uh, so if you wanna be entered to win, so we have a you know, JetBrains license and a post shop license is typically what we have. Um, you know, make sure to go ahead and we'll give everybody a couple more minutes to get your, get your name in the chat uh, before we do the, the raffle, so. You can probably go ahead and stop recording at this point. Um.